Father, we come before you and we thank you and we praise you. We exalt you. Thank you for the cooler weather. Thank you for the clouds. Thank you for the rain. Thank you for our gathering. Thank you. We glorify your name for you are worthy to be praised. We thank you that you have brought us all here, that you are your provision. You are our safety. You are our protection. And Father, for whatever the enemy has planned, we thank you, Father, that his plans are thwarted, that no weapon formed against each and every one of us as individuals, as families, and as a group, Father, shall prosper. And every tongue that's risen up against us, we condemn, for that's our heritage in Yeshua. We thank you, Father, that we hold true to you. You are you are true. You are our truth. You are our light. Open up our hearts and minds to whatever you would have to say to us today. We give you glory and honor and praise in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. All right. So we're going to talk about the four species today. And that sounds where four species are the aliens. No. We're going to open with Vaikra or Leviticus 2340. So I only see one person here with their word. So I'm going to have Miss Joy Freeman read the scripture. On the first day, you are to take the choice fruit, palm fronds, thick branches, and root curls, <laughs> and celebrate in the presence of Yehovah your Elohim for seven days. You are to observe it as a feast to Yehovah seven days in the year. It is a permanent regulation, generation after generation. Keep it in the seventh month. You are to live in Sukkot for seven days. Every citizen of Israel is to live in a Sukkah, so that generation after generation of you will know that I made the people of Israel live in Sukkot when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am Yehovah, your Elohim. Thus Moshe announced to the people of Israel that the design times of Edom. Is that the name? Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. So what we have, my my verse says, or my scripture says, on the first day, you shall take the fruit of a citrus tree, palm branches, boughs of fig trees, and brick willows, and you shall rejoice before Ye Ye Yahweh seven days. Or it say Hadar citrus fruit, which is citrus fruit. So now this is a weird command. I mean, up here in the world, we think, okay, so I take some things from trees and I go rejoice with them. Okay, how many of you guys really truly get that when you just read it off the top like that? Okay, why? What what does Yah have us doing for that? Why does he have us doing that? And he named specific one. He did. It, you know, in practice, we actually, they have a tendency to take seven species, a lulav, a, a one etrog, three hedicim, and two are bought. But I know those are Hebrew words, and we're going to go over them here in a minute. But, you know, that's tradition. But he is very clear. This is a mitzvah. This is a command. He says, do this. Did he say, if you want to take this and this and this and this and rejoice? Was it a, was it that? Is that what he said? Tell us, he tells us to rejoice to him with the branches of these four different types of trees. So, and that's what's called the four species. And that's what we're going to get into. So on the, during the times of the first and second temple periods, sorry, I'm getting from faith. All right. Um, the branches or the date palm, the brook willow, the myrtle, and the citrus fruit, there was a waving ceremony. It happened every first day of Sukkot. Though some traditionally will shake this every time we come together. And to me, with the idea that we we're commanded to rejoice with these things, I think it's a pretty good idea. When we used them last year during Sukkot, I think a lot of the people were really moved by it. But yet we didn't have the, not that we're going to have complete understanding even now. But to have more understanding, I think it's going to affect us a little more because this is a command. Now, people do that in synagogues and their sukkahs when they come together. And after the blessings recited, the citron fruit, the branches of the date palm, myrtle and, myrtle and willow, they're bound together and they're shaken. We're even going to go over that. Actually, if you look at YouTube, different people shake it different ways. But there is no command you need to shake it this way. <laughs> that is all tradition. And we need to remember that. Now, I want to go over some of the traditional views of these four, four things that we gather together and bind together. I don't necessarily agree with any of these, but we should look at, when you're studying, you should look at everything, pray, and, and then figure it out. So the first one is talking about the relationship with other people. The Midrash says that the etrog, it tastes good. It tastes really good. Looks like lemon. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. It tastes really good and it, and it smells really good. Yeah. And so 
I let mine dry out <laughs> from last year. <laughs> and we're going to be using that tonight. I have four sets, so we'll be using them tonight and probably every night from here on out. But it says because it smells good and it tastes good, it represents wisdom, which is the learning Torah, and good deeds. Okay, so here we have, that's good deeds and wisdom. And, okay. And the next one, the myrtle, I'm not going to get it out. That's going to take something, but we'll look at it later. The myrtle has a good fragrance, but you can't eat it. Smell. So that's right. You can't smell. So it's supposed to represent one who has good deeds, but has no Torah learning, no wisdom whatsoever. So. This back. It's in perfect for its puppy. <clears throat> and then the lulav, which is the date palm, is edible, but it doesn't smell at all. So it's said to represent a person who's following Torah, who walks in wisdom, but they don't do anything good. Now, personally, I don't see how you can follow Torah and have nothing good that you do. I don't see how those would go together, actually. <laughs> but this tradition says that's the next one. And then the erva, the willow, doesn't taste or smell, so you can guess what kind of person it represents. They don't follow Torah, and they don't do anything nice. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so uh, uh, that's not that that wouldn't be a good thing. So that's one view. <laughs> Another view is about looking inwardly to yourself. So this lulav, which is the general lulav, is one part, but the whole thing together is called a lulav when you're just talking about the whole unit as well. So. It says that the etrog represents your heart and your emotions. Oh. And the myrtle, the hadas, represents your eyes, so what you see. Um, and to me, any time you think of eyes, to me it also talks about discernment and spiritual insight as well. So we've got somebody who has the, the heart, which is represented by the etrog, the fruit, the myrtle, the, what you see, what you discern, and the lulav is, represents the spine or where where actions emanate. Again, these are views. I'm just presenting them. I don't necessarily agree. And the Erevah, the willow, represents our speech and what we say, which all of those things together, if you think about it, our heart and our emotions, our mind, our mind, will, and emotions, our eyes, what we see, what do we discern, what we do, and what we say, that pretty much nails who we are. And so they say that whole unit represents all of those things about us. So if we look at it, each of those things really do matter. If one of those things is off in our lives, we are way off, period. We need to do some self-examination on that. Now, each one of those things is different, but together, together, when we walk over this, it's supposed to represent something bigger than one each piece by itself. So you, you have this big lemon. Okay. Eh. You have a branch of a myrtle tree. Got lots of those around Texas, Oklahoma, North Carolina. <laughs> You have myrtles, a lot of myrtles. Oh, fun, yes. All right, so that, okay, there's a myrtle tree. Oh, there's a date palm. Okay, but each of those things by themselves, what are they? But together, what does y'all want to do and to show us and to have us experience when you bring those four things and they're combined as one? So I have here that each time we take up the four species, the lulav, all of those items, we recite the blessing and we wave them in four directions. What we're declaring, it, we're declaring God's will to gather to himself worshipers from the nations. And it is a beautiful and fragrant sweet gathering who will rejoice before him in Jerusalem during his millennial reign here on earth. Now, so that's another national view. Each of those four species represents the four corners of the earth where he's going to gather his bride. And we're going to come together, each different, but yet the same. What's going to bind it? What is going to make us together? What's going to unite us? It's Yeshua. But also, hopefully, we are of like mind and like kind, though we look different, though we may do things differently. We should still, by our actions and our thought process, be of like mind and like kind, and he will gather us together. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's a pretty amazing pro that's process. Good. Yeah, that's Tammy. The etrog is the citron. So I'm, I'm giving you the list. Okay. Etrog. E-T-R-O-G, citron fruit. Now the citron fruit is said to be one of three. I don't think I agree with this because I just can't imagine a garden of, of, of Eden without limes and lemons and grapefruit and all of that. 
with all of it. So I'm not sure I agree with this, but tradition says there were three original citrus fruits. It, one was the etrog, one was the pomelo, and one was the mandarin. And then every other citrus fruit is a hybrid of those. I don't know that I agree with that, but I don't know. Well, just so you know, the pomelo is a grapefruit. Okay. I didn't know. That's sucker. It's huge. Oh, really? Wow. Well, maybe there's truth to it. Who knows? But It is a grapefruit. And it may be the original grapefruit that the other grapefruits came from. Okay. Yeah. The mandarin is an orange. orange. The citron looks like a lemon. All right. Cross-pollination. Cross -pollination. Like a liger. Tampering with. Well, that was or me. creating. I don't want to use the word GMO, but you know, you combine two. So you can sit on the map and that can get warm. Like grafting or cross pollinate cross hybrids because they were cross pollinated. Yeah. Okay. The next one for you guys is the lulav, which is the palm the date palm. So it's that palm leaf. And you actually get dates that you eat from them? Is that where the dates come yeah. from? It, when you go to Israel, one of the things is you see you go down there and, and you see rows and rows and rows and rows of date palm trees. Yeah. So, and the next one is Hadass, which is your motor bow, myrtle bow. Said Hadass? H-A-D-A-S-S. -S. Okay. Yeah. And then the last one is your Arava, A-R-A-V-A-H. Yes. And that is your willow branch. Okay. I'm going to give you a couple quotes from... Before you go there. Okay. All right. The citron fruit is edible. You get the date palm. Okay. Okay. Keep going. The date palm pro provides edible fruit. The willow is where you get your aspirin. It's a medicinal tree. I'm not sure I've got to research when I get back, but I think that you get medicinal properties from the myrtle as well. Oh, myrtle. Yeah. Yeah. There's always so there is so so that's something you know there's something there. Very good. I didn't research that part, so you know you got that whole new thing to do there. So Sonia and Marco Nadler Institute of Archaeology, the Steinhardt Museum of Natural History, says this mitzvah includes a reference to mm -hmm. two known species of plants, branches of palms and willows mm -hmm. of the brook. But scholars were undecided what fruit of goodly hadar trees is. And that, so they don't know if it refers to specific plants or gives to general instructions. Yeah, specific species or not. But, yeah, it's pretty specific, but you know. Anyway, so let's look at this etrog again, which is the citron fruit. Citron became established in tradition long ago, and you can see the citron in coins and um, other things. But we need to know that the citron was not native to Israel. It was brought in. It was said to be come in from the India and south of China, south China, in that area. So we have the myrtle native to Israel, date native to Israel, willow native to Israel. But according to Dr. Langut, the etrog originates from East India and the south of China. And again, it's one of the early ancestors, as we spoke before. In other cultures, it's called Hindi. In Hindi, it's called Tarang. In Persia, it's called Tarang. And later, it was called Etrang. It, it, it Say that nine times fast. <laughs> but here's what's really cool is that they actually found the pollen from this fruit in Israel, in a palace in Israel. I have here, uh, during an archaeological excavation of Kibbutz Ramat Rakel near Jerusalem, it, they were looking at an old pool area. There was plaster. In the plaster, where they found pollen from the cedars of Lebanon, and they found pollen from the etron or the citron, and then they also found pollen from the walnut tree. All in this palace there in there in Israel, and so I find that very interesting that 
because of that, it dates way back. That tradition, it is tradition that dates way back. So it gives us, has this just come over in the last, you know, few hundred years? No, it's been happening for a while. So it says here that the fossilized citron pollen was preserved in the coating of that pool's plaster. Also, earliest archaeological botanical evidence of the cultivation of etrog in the land of Israel and throughout the general Mediterranean basin was really opened the door for other research concerning the four species because of what happened at that pool. Here's another quote. I know I'm going to stop with the quotes pretty well, probably after this, but it says here the idea of cultivating the etrog seems to have trickled slowly down into Jewish tradition from the royal garden at Ramat Rachel, the seat of the representative of the Persian Empire to which our area belonged 2,500 years ago. So that's 25, at least for 2,500 years, they've been using the citron for something in Israel. And at first, only royalty or people, well, pretty high up would have the citron. And then it trickled down to nobles and then it became more common among everyone. So it had a journey of its own. And that's just a little bit of the background of that. But I, I want us to go over that truck specifically because it's not native to Israel. But now I want us- Well, it's not native according to that one person that you researched right. and said. Not one, it was, it was a whole bunch, but- Really? Yeah. Because but it could have been. been. It could have been. That could represent us. We're not native. I mean, you know. Yeah, I I'm still not buying it. We have a just just personally. You think it was native? Just, yeah, because it doesn't it's, set well with my soul that that God wants these to be a part of this. Everything else that's a part of Sukkot and all the other stuff is all native to Israel. Is this one little thing? But is it a good, maybe it's the uh, wrong thing. Okay, because remember, tradition said, with what citrus fruit are we going to take? Yeah, I get it. So I don't maybe know. I just don't envision one being grafted in. Mm -hmm. It says I, goodly I, I, fruit. I that. That's, that's a nice little well, that, way for us to look at it. No, no, or maybe there was, but we lost yeah, it. So that doesn't mean uh, fruit. Mirage or whatever. No, the one where everything. Tarange, tarange. Yeah, all those, all those are oranges. Could be committed with. That sounds like it. Well, yeah, from the other cultures. And I agree with Mark. I, I, I thought, you know, why are all these part of Israel and this one not? But, and that's why I prefaced everything with tradition. This is what they're using. Okay, but, here's, here's a thought. What if at one time it had been native to Israel, and something happened and wiped it yeah. out? And then it was only found. Yeah. Or it, it was somebody going to Israel or one of the past explorers found it, took it somewhere else. And that's where it was dominant. So that, I mean, there's all kinds of theories and all we're doing is theory along with these people. Mm -hmm. These people didn't, weren't there. They just have done their research and that's what they come up. Uh, it's just not everything <laughs> that somebody says from history is a fact. Agree. Okay. Agree. And that's where, uh, I'm sorry, but my thought process always goes there. Yeah. Because, you know, there wasn't yeah. anybody, there wasn't uh, anybody alive today except the shoe and it was there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> unless, <laughs> unless it's archaeologically found, like even what you were saying they found the pollen of this and that. That's archaeologically found and proven. Mm -hmm. That's a different story. But just because somebody did a research and they only found it here, they didn't find it there, that kind of thing doesn't make it a fact, in my opinion. Bob? Um, wasn't the commandment given on Sinai? For what? The, the first road read? Yes. That listed the, 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 the species. species, right? Um, they, and they were keeping Sukkot at Sinai. They weren't in the promised land. They weren't in Israel yet when they got yeah, that. That's my Maybe. thought too. Is <laughs> that hmm. that that right there? Yeah, that's given that's it good. Sinai, they were keeping it Sukkot at Sinai. 
and and how are Other the Israelites supposed to go to Asia and get it? And, well, and that's and true. And I want us to always remember the way Israel and the land looks today is not what it looked like yeah. before. Right. It was beautiful and lush. Right. Well, how do you think in the, all the wood was taken to burn? How many campfires? <laughs> <laughs> Millions of people. And not only that, I mean, the land looked different. The land, sin destroys the that's land. Right. Sin become, lets causes something beautiful to become a desert waste. Yep. So always remember that. Mm -hmm. So that no matter what you say, though, compared to the other mitzvot, to the other commands, to the other instructions, to the other, the other things that are set in motion, the other laws of physics, this is a weird one. I mean, it's just a little weird. So I want us to look at these plants and look at some other maybe another direction that this should take us that's going to bring forth deeper meaning so we have number one which is the capote tamarine or the palm fronds the leaves of a tree so is it a specific leaf okay the top of the palm do you remember last year and like i said it's in that box i just wasn't it yep okay sugar. this oh, goes at the top of a palm tree it's your lula, and what happens is as it matures, it spreads out like this. Oh, so that's the palm leaf? Yep, it's a closed palm leaf. Show me again. Mm -hmm. Smell oh, it. You've got a whole slew of stuff. I bought four of them. Oh, my God. Take so. <laughs> those are actually pretty good. I ate one of those last year. You, you can't know. smell it. Probably it's not very good. After strong. the... After Sukkot, I took one home. I was like, hey, I'm going to eat this. Yeah, that's really like, it's actually yeah. tastes similar yeah, to the lemon, good. but it's sweeter than a lemon. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so as Not they're as passing dinner. that around, so here's that palm from, and that, and that lulav is generally what you call the whole thing that we talked about. Now, what does it say after that? It says to have a thick branch of the tree. There you go. I'm not going to pass this around. Just... That looks oh, like yeah. that's the myrtle, isn't it? The first thing you have is the lulav. The next step you have the vanav. It's a vote. It's the very branch. Uh, I guess it would be this. Yeah, this one. The thick, the branch of a tree, and then you take those. That the willow. The next one, but I want you to think about something. First, we have a fruit, and then we have a leaf, and then we have a branch. Fruit leaf branch are you starting to see a picture here yeah we're starting to see all of a sudden we have a fruit and we have a, a, the the leaves and now a branch it's it's like we're moving further away from the fruit but we're sort of looks like we're encompassing a whole tree but there's one more thing that's needed to look at that tree and what is it well when we look at the next step and you take the three elements it's that willow and that willow, what's unique about this plant? Willows have a tendency to grow on or in water. So it I want takes to a think lot about of water, this. Like the, the since the willows grow by water or on or in water, we're seeing this progression of the whole life cycle of a tree. Now, I also want you to remember <clears throat> we are trees. Mm -hmm. We are to bear fruit. Branches have our bodies. And we're supposed to be planted where? In the holy water, in the living, into the living water, and have that living, have that living water be our life source. So the willow sticks to the ground with that living water as its life source, which 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 brings forth the the life to the tree, which brings forth life to the leaf, and brings forth life to the fruit. And so here we're starting to get this picture through this whole set of of tree parts that it's bigger than just a parts of trees, because if you think about it, it's a whole ecosystem that's lined up. It's more than an ecosystem. It's a whole cycle of life right there that's represented in your hand when you're good, holding them. Good, good Is that an accident? <laughs> no. And if you even think about it, if you, on that branch, the branch really represents the truck because the branch is woody. If you saw that thing, you saw the wood, the brown wood. On the myrtle. You can see that through there. So it really can help represent that whole tree. And then you get to the willow and it's connected to the water. It's the water is very significant. What comes before the fruit? One more time. Well, you take, you have a leaf 
around the fruit before the fruit. And then you have the branch and then you have the body. So if you think of trees like people, and this lulav itself could represent us because that's what we see as an idiom in the word. What does that say about us? Now, remember, we're supposed to rejoice at Sukkot. It's not, it's not an idea. It's a command. I want you to just think about that for a minute because we are the trees and the branches and the leaves and the fruit and our source is Yeshua, right? So when you hold these different parts of this tree, of these trees into your hands, you're, ho you're holding the whole process of life mm -hmm. is in your hand. Mm -hmm. well, and it should cause us to remember the source of life. Is it us? Are we the ones that make the life work? No, no, it's always Yeshua. It is always Yah. It, the whole story is held in our hands at Sukkot. And why should we rejoice then? Because we have life. And according to the word, we should have that more abundantly. It depends on our viewpoint. It depends on how we see things. If we're negative beings, then it's if we're negative beings, then no matter what is going on, no matter how wonderful it is, we're going to criticize. We're never going to find joy. All we're going to find is, oh, I wish I wasn't here. I wish I wasn't, you know, this, so what about this time? I'm doing the command, but I don't want to. I'd rather be so and so. Let's be really honest. We've all had moments when we were even starting to get here. We're like, I don't want to go. I don't know how I can go. This is impossible. What are we supposed to do? There's no joy in this. Well, sometimes there's not joy in the harvest. But right now, we are supposed to pause. And we're supposed to find joy when we think about the life that is provided in these things that we're holding in our hands. Just this morning, I said, if God, if being here at SCOTUS is supposed to show us how, how we take for granted how easy we have life, he's doing a real good job. Because that's exactly what he's doing to me is showing me that I'm taking for granted I have life really. You know what? I think it's, there's always, no matter what our circumstance, what we're going through, what we're experiencing, there's always somebody that has at, at people, not just one person. I was thinking there's this always morning. people that suffer far more than whatever we're suffering. Mm -hmm. When Jonathan was walking through his ordeal and it was ripping my heart out every day and our family and our, there's always people that have it worse. And you know what? I have a strong man of y'all that got through that on the other side and look at it. So, and I should rejoice with that. But you're right, Mark. There's, we've got to learn as a people to stop always looking at what's wrong and start praising him for what's right. Even if there's one thing right, only what I always say, if you're looking at your spouse and they only do one thing right, which is button their pajamas, then you praise y'all that they button their pajamas right every day. If that's the only thing. But we should look at our life and our circumstance the same way. What, how, what can I praise you for today? Mm -hmm. And in all honesty, when we have hardship and are going through stuff, we should not look at the circumstance that we're dealing with right now. For the word says to call things that are not as though they are. So we look at the victory, victory Sukkot. We look at the victory of that circumstance down the line. And we say, I thank you that this is taken care of. Be specific. I thank you that you've done this. I thank you that you are more than enough. I thank you that these bills are paid. I thank you that you made a way. And we need to begin to list and rejoice uh, with our deliverer on all those things, even if we aren't experiencing them right now and in all honesty that's sort of where we're going right now i'm not finished but that's where we're going with this because it's it, we're supposed to stop and recognize carrying this whole process this whole source of life the whole story stop and think who is our source what is our source because it's not you it's not me it's not our great ability to do things not at all we have nothing to do with anything nothing Absolutely nothing. We are supposed to work it, but we don't have anything to do it. So we've got to ask ask ourselves, here we have the fruit of the tree, the capote tamarine, the leaves, the etzavot, the branch, the arriva, the call, the willows, and then rejoice. Go straight to the source. We're going to be rejoicing because we're in God's presence. When we hold that, Adina and I talked about God's presence last night, and that should be something we are constantly striving for striving for it, uh, that's not quite the right word, but throwing ourselves on the altar so that we burn so that for him and we send up that sweet aroma 
because that worship causes his presence to envelop us. Mm -hmm. And when we, I can tell you right now, is he going to come down in an atmosphere of criticism, in an atmosphere of negativity, in an atmosphere of anger, jealousy, bitterness, offense? Is he going to come down and, and encounter us that way? Not in a nice way. He would not come down in a nice way. It might be more like you got, you didn't physically, spiritually get burned up. You, yeah, exactly. Here, when we're holding this lulav, it's like we are meeting with our creator. We're, we follow the process way back to the source. And the water is, is the water. Yeshua is the source. But ultimately, who is the water? It's Yahweh. So Yeshua. So that right there. God's presence, because of that, there should be great rejoicing in us. We're experiencing the fruit, but where did the fruit come from? And then we, when we realize the source that it's not, oh, look what I did. I, my, my garden, I worked hard and look what I, I caused to produce. Really? Mm -mm. Uh -uh. Then we think we become the source in our expertise, in our activity. No, we should stand in amazement that anything can come from what we do with the work of our hands, but the ultimate, the ultimate source is always Yah. So even when we're gardening out there and, and a lot of us here are, do do that, ultimately, I sing the Shema in my garden every day and mm -hmm. sing over it and do that sort of thing. But I know that in and of my own self, I can learn and I have learned some things. Yah showed me a lot of things, but the ultimate source of the fruit of the work of my hands, and that can go beyond a garden, folks. The ultimate source of the fruit of your hands and your labor will, will and is never us. So we need to be rejoicing in our creator. And the thing that happens is when things become for us so easy, let's go back to food. You forget the source of life when you just go to the supermarket and get what you need all the time. It's easy. I'll get it at the market. We got a taste of that during the seat thing. There's such a disconnect. There's such a disconnect when we've lost our roots to the soil and to the land. Exactly. You're right. Got far away from hunger. Time still. I mean, to get an animal, that's a big deal. It's a big deal. I got to be real hungry to do that. Well, that's disconnect. And that's why initially, remember, that's why the lamb came into the house for four days. So we realize that that life that we're about to take, we, we love it. We've, we've grown accustomed to it. And it's costly. So you're absolutely right, Adina. Absolutely right. That's a good point. When we bundle all of this together, all of it together, we shouldn't, we shouldn't just be moved by it, by the things in our hands, but we should realize the source of our bounty that connects us to what we hold, that it goes back to water, that it goes back to God, to Yahweh, and there should be great joy back to the living water. It's supposed to be so much more beautiful. It's not an act that we just rush through. I was thinking about something Adina said, and it's a, some, this is one thing that I, when I, we first started realizing there were teachers out there and we weren't just teaching Torah stuff ourselves. I would go and I would listen to the summer, some of the teaching, you know, and it would be just blah, 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 blah. and I was like, all they're doing, and I, and that, and then they pray, and it's just those written broke prayers, and then they say, blah, 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 blah. and I was like, prayer is a conversation, and each word should have meaning and should have something behind it. And when we rush through, these words, when we rush through these actions just to get through them so, and say we did it, we didn't really do it. No, really. We followed motions and oh, sort of. God with the mouth and not the heart. Right. <clears throat> no different than the Catholic Church. Liturgy. 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 Go ahead. I'm sorry. No. No. Liturgy <laughs> set up by God to be a part of the worship. And when you make any part of worship wrote, wrote. Mm -hmm. you are not worshiping you right. you have literally put it on stop you didn't you didn't put it on pods you put it on stop when you you do so anything like that and like when you 
do worship or any other place where where there is as soon as you start worship that's it that's that now the whole presence the whole area where we're at is now in the presence of god and nothing should be going on except worship i agree nothing when you start that's it everything else stops i agree it's, if it, it, i mean if you're away from it if you're in another room if you're somewhere else then that's a different story you're not in that presence of god you know but if you're i i, I know there's various no i was that, no i was but agreeing. i mean right there in i mean even in the pavilion where it's wide open we're in that <laughs> presence that's the god's there why why is there anything else going on because there's no fear there's no revenue. yeah i i get it but i'm just trying to make points it's the same thing with your four species <laughs> worship the, right. he didn't say bring those out when the message comes down bring those out when you're doing a sketch or whatever you know he didn't say that it, it's all worship they're all to be brought out right worship and, and so that's why i'm saying it, it's it's that's exactly what you're presenting right there it's all worship and we need i believe in my opinion I, as soon as i hear any worship start any time at all that's it i stop but or i have to leave if i have to do something else and worship going on i can't be in that area that, that's just my opinion I, yeah i agree i agree 100 with you but here's the next thing john is really big like at life of worship he wants there's one vision and even if you would go into the next room and worship's going on that's still division there's two visions there and should we all not crave to enter into his presence if there's a call to worship that we should be so excited that we run to be in that presence mm -hmm. even if we don't under and then we challenge ourselves to go beyond the veil of wh wherever our barrier already is and we say i don't get it this isn't for me then you say y'all change my heart yeah. and let me and you can just get counter you can close your eyes and it just be you and him <clears throat> don't have to worry about anything else but you're right you're 100 mm -hmm. right we cannot mm -hmm. do anything in the word just as a road experience to get through it yeah and I see a lot of that fruit of road experience in what we do as a people in a group, not this individual group. I'm talking as a large group. Well, so every one of us would experience even our leader being in the same room and worship is going on and they're talking with somebody in the back. You there. have no they're idea how that affects me. I know. Every one of us has experienced it. And it, it, it to me, it's a red flag. <laughs> it, it, it's it, like, Go somewhere else. Go, you know. And I I want to just walk up to like near somebody and say, you know. And those are two big else. culprits. Sorry. Yeah. They are. And, and and it <laughs> it's like to them. Oh, they're like. Yeah. No. I know. I'm. But it's still uh, we've all. Are they above? Are they any different than you or me? Absolutely no, not. Been, you uh, lead by example. Yeah. They, exactly. A true leader will sacrifice themselves. Yeah. Yeah. You're a servant. You're yeah. not. On a podium. Okay. If you're on a podium, you better be careful because y'all are going to knock you down. Yeah, I agree. So, right. So holding these, we have the whole creative process in our hands. We remember our creator and what he's done for us. And it, we, it's encountering him all it viscerally, directly. And we get to experience what he's done and think about what he's done through all creation. Look around us. We love beauty. North Carolina is beautiful all the time, but this kind of thing isn't common to us. We, we come out here and it's like, oh, mm -hmm. look what he's made. And it, because it's not common for us. And it, we get to experience that with this misfold. We get to walk through that whole creative pr process and remember him and have the, we get to encounter the source. And that's what we need to remember. We get to encounter our source, the living source. And when we do, that should bring such mm -hmm. joy to our hearts. We are to rejoice. <laughs> so we gather in our crops. It's work. It's a harvest festival. We know Sukkot's a harvest festival. We gather them in. But what what is all that? Okay. When we have the abundance, whether it's an abundance or whether it's one fruit that came off our plant, it's still a gift. 
whether it is the job we have or like John, you know, John is head, headed to Oklahoma this morning. It won't be long, but we pray. I praise y'all that he's provided that so that we can have some money come into our house. Sure. I praise y'all that he is the source and he's bringing forth the free. I praise y'all that even though there's just a handful of people here, you know what? The remnant is small. And we've got to look at that side of things. He is still the source. He is the one that brought us here for whatever reason or purpose. He called us to gather because he wanted to encounter us here. And guess what? It's, it's revival and fire it usually starts in the small places and then it gets to the big. Twelve, 12 disciples set with their master set the world on fire. Well, became seven, became Noah. So can it be for us and wherever we're at, whatever we're doing with the work of our hands, our jobs, our, the network, the, the TV, the TV, the, all of it, all of it. Who is our source? Because all that we hold in our hands, all that we have on our back, these are gifts. Our the source was never us in all things. And we need to remember that the Torah is telling us to go beyond our enjoyment of the harvest, beyond the work of our hands. And, and stop disconnecting from the source because let's be really honest, we do fail to remember at times that the source of whatever we have, of everything that we have is Yahweh, nothing else. We've got to go beyond that and remember where everything came from because it was given to us. It was a gift. And it sort of takes us back to the Garden of Eden, Garden of Eden, Gone and Done. <laughs> And you could eat from all the trees, but there was one you couldn't. So what am I saying? Because we're talking about the trees. Trees are people, et cetera, et cetera. But right now, let's go back to the garden. And there's this sense of connection when you think about it this way, because they were also honoring and reverencing y'all as they were enjoying what he had given them. But he held one thing back. One thing. So as long as they were following his commands, as long as they were enjoying what he's provided, remembering their source, there was this connection. The presence of Yah was upon them, was around them, encountered them every day. And then boom, there was a disconnect because all of a sudden that command doesn't need followed. I broke that one. Well, completely disconnected them from the creator. It was never the same again. And it's the same with us when we choose to follow, not follow this command because, oh, what does it matter? It's not a salvation issue. <laughs> really, I disagree with that. It's all salvation issue, everyone. Because he says, if you love me, you keep your commands except for 329 and 613. Those you don't have to worry about. It's not what he says. He says you follow them. And if you don't, you don't love me. It, why? Well, you didn't say that. Well, it says if you love me, you follow them. And you don't follow them begrudgingly because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks and your actions show it. If we're not even to give, if we're going to have a fit about giving, how much are we supposed to give God anything that's not our very best? As Adina and I were talking about, when we give worship, Whatever it is, it should cost us. It should be pricey. David says, I'm not going to take the threshing floor for nothing. I'm going to pay for it. Because why would I give God anything that costs me nothing? And that's the same which we should think of. So when we're worshiping and when we're following his commands, it should be out of the abundance of our heart and we should rejoice in it because he's provided those things so that we can have life and that more abundantly. He's provided those things so that we don't have to face some of the troubles we face if we don't, when we don't. And we disconnect and we bring death into our lives. We forget who, our, who is our source. We begin to rethink that we're the source of everything and that it's what our own hands that accomplish, our own hands that cause things to happen in our life. And we mess up the, prom the process and we forget that he sustains our life. He sustains our bodies. He's the provider. He's provided the gifts through all of creation. And we've refused. We don't recognize him anymore as the source that we're in his domain. If we can respect and acknowledge the creator's domain, we can eat and enjoy everything. 
that he's given us. Now, I didn't say everything in the world because everything that's in the world, <laughs> everything he's given us to enjoy. Adam and Eve forgot that. They forgot, they forgot it and they defaulted their connection. I've at times when I've grabbed a hold and I said, okay, y'all, you can be on the throne except for this thing, this thing right here. I, I need to get a control on that one. So get off the throne for a minute. I'm going to take care of this myself. I just disconnected. I just, just, yes, I put myself on the throne and we do that. Guys, if don't shout me down because I guarantee each and every one of you have done the same thing. So, so, but as long as you don't eat from the tree, but you eat from all the other trees, we're always, okay, and when I say that, I'm still talking about the commands. We're connecting and we're thanking God for what we have. Have you ever thought about following his instructions, following his commands, following what he said in motion? It's giving him thanks. Hmm. Saying, you know what? Wow, thank you for this. Have you ever thought of it in that way? Acknowledge. Yes. Well, as long as I'm doing this, there's an umbilical cord that is being broken. And I, I can call on you. That's why prayer, I don't believe prayer should be this little instant. I believe you should begin to pray in the morning before your feet hit the ground. And then you, it's sort of open-ended all day long. Now you have specific things where you go in and out. That's right. Here's the problem. We can take the fruit from the world. It might taste good for a little bit. And I know I'm preaching to the choir, but we need to hear these things. And we can try to hide ourselves from the truth. We can disconnect, but in everything we're going to do then, once we've disconnected, it's not with true joy. It's not with true joy. We distance ourselves. You know, if we choose what we eat, if we choose what commandment we follow, it's always going to result, maybe not the very moment, but it will always result in curse. It will always result in destruction. It will always result in sadness. Maybe not this very moment, but it is coming. So we get what we read. Joy doesn't in, uh, often appear until after we've done the hard work. So y'all did the hard work to get here. It's time for joy. It's time to say, ah, you brought us here. I'm so excited to see what you're about to do. You brought us here. Look at what you've done how you greened up the grass for us. You brought forth rain. You brought forth life. You've cooled the days down for everything that's happening around us. We should find great joy in as well as each other. Find joy as we fellowship with each other because it's a gift. Are we going to disconnect from the gift? Are we going to disconnect from the source? Getting out there and working, working what he's put in our life. Working lambnetwork.tv can be a lot of work. Sometimes you wonder, you see the fruit. Yes, I know. So is past. And you think, I don't see the fruit. Because uh, let's be faith. Let's face it. We have this tendency to look at numbers. I don't see the fruit. I don't see the fruit that I should see. And Father, it breaks my heart. Why am I doing this? Terry, dear, you're doing what you're doing. Follow my plans. Things you can share. Here in this place, one more time, Father, the vision is so big, and look what we have here. Sandra, Terry, here, trust me, rejoice in what you have. Thank you, Father. He just told me, go out to this land and call in the people. Yes, Father, we will do that. We do that today. We'll go out, and we'll blow that shofar, and we'll call, because we should not see this. We should see the vision that he's given us. For our, for our lives, for our homes, for our ministry, and we should rejoice. So today, and I'm sorry, this is off the fly because you just said that. Today, we should rejoice that this campground is full. We should thank him. We should thank him for it because Judah goes first, praise goes first. We should thank him for the massive amounts around the world, people that are tuning in to lambnetwork.tv and their lives are changing to life of worship. To our job on the road, Father, I thank you that you give me divine connections, that you brought forth provision more than I could ask or think. Every area of our life, Father, that you've given me great wisdom to tool and do the things and raise a family and everything that you call me to do. We need to bring it down, not to, to the family, but then we need to bring it down to our lives individually and praise him for that and find the joy 
because that's what bees represent, the joy in what we're doing, because then we can understand and we can receive the blessing when we're connected to the source all the way, all the time. So Sukkot is a time to remind ourselves who our true source is and where the abundance of our life came from, came where it came from. And yeah, there was a journey to get here because the enemy does not want the power of the things that we do here at Sukkot to be manifest in our life because then he loses and we have the victory. See, we've already won the victory. We reinforce it by what we do, by what we say, by how we see, by how we interact with each other, by even what we do here. It matters. So we can't look, oh, this is disappointing and this is disappointing. And I'm not just talking here. I'm talking in general in our lives. We can't look, wow, this thing, this battle that you just, that I just entered into is way bigger than I can do. Well, guess what? It's not your battle to win. It's already won. You're there to do what he says. And then he gets the glory. Because we remember that he's the source. He's the one that will, that will remove everything that needs to be removed. And he's going to shake things that can't be shaken. Because he's readying his bride for himself. Are we going to choose to rejoice during this time? Are we going to choose to see this, the source, the fruit is from in the leaf and the branch and the source of the water. Those four things that we hold in our hands that represent life, that represent life more abundantly, that represent Yah has connected me to this here. And he has privileged me and given me these things. We can't seek the joy in what we have. We can't seek the joy in, in what we've accomplished. We seek the joy for him. And that's the message. Well, it's a message. <laughs> so I have here, I have the official prayer. It says, Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech Ha'alam Asher Kiddushanu B'mitzvotah Metzibanu Netik Lat Lulav. And that's blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who sanctified us with his commands, commanding us regarding taking the Lulav. And then you pick up the Etrog after that. This is next. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has granted us life, sustained us, and enabled us to reach this engagement. 